einsteigen. Oh, okay. We saw um, some additional karma which are meant for maturity and that included prayers and different types of prayers including the uh, using the limbs, then the speech and also the mind. Okay? Um, one thing in the process of explaining of what are different types of prayer, uh, Ramana Maharshi also explains what the nature of Ishwara is. Okay, we saw that Ashtamurti. So what is important to understand is that our prayers are useful only when we understand. I mean they are meaningful and they are unshakable only when we understand what the nature of Ishwara is. Okay? So I will tell you some of the things that can happen. If you think that Ishwara is some entity out there, okay, then you feel that uh, why that person has all compassion, all love, then how come there is so much misery in this world? Okay? And has all the power to do whatever. So why is he making people suffering so much? Okay? So that means that if your concept of Ishwara, if it is not correct, this is a question that you are bound to have. Or you can have a question as to, I am praying but still many things don't happen to me and somebody else is not praying and look what a good life they seem to have in my vision. Okay? So therefore what is the use of prayer? The third thing that you can have, very simple, if you have a little bit logical mind, then you can just ask, you know, how can prayer work? Two people want promotion, both are praying for it, only there is one position, one is going to get it. Okay. So why is somebody's prayer is answered and my prayer is not answered and on what basis? So all these questions you have because you don't understand the nature of Ishwara and the nature of prayer and how it works. So in this whole thing, we are not prescribing here. You have to understand. We are not saying you should pray, you should do Japa, you should. It's all understanding what does it do for you. Okay. How does it help you? What are the ways in which it transforms you? When that is properly understood, it becomes something which is natural. Okay? So the whole teaching is just making you understand the realities and then what kind of karmas are useful based on understanding that reality so that you become more and more person who is alive to what is and live your life dynamically. Okay? Now, uh, just to go uh, further with this idea, um, this text. so we saw further uh, in the last. Uh, this thing that not only Ishwara is in form of the laws, but it is also in form of different objects that are there in the universe which seem to be governed by the laws. Okay. Now, 
it goes further, uh, verse 6. Uttamastavada Uchamandataha Chittajapam Japa Dhyanam Uttamam. Okay. So what is said he, here is some kind of a comparison. Compared to loud chanting of the glories of the Lord, repeating his name uh, in a murmur or meditation in form of mental chanting is better in order. So that is the question you were answering, asking why. Okay. So here we are not trying to say this is good, this is, we are not trying to be judgmental. The whole rule is that when there is more effort involved on your part, then it will certainly give more results. Okay. So therefore, in the, uh, the, the loud chanting, sometimes what happens is that even uh, first of all you need to learn chanting to be able to chant. Okay. But what happens is that when chanting is loud, sometimes it becomes very mechanical. Okay. You just do these mantras and you do this and so you get into this automatic mode where you you are not very alert about it. Okay? But when you are chanting softly what happens is that sometimes you will see <coughs> that your mind will go into the loops. If you are not alert, uh, especially there is a chant of Purusha Suptam where there are two parts where if you don't, if you are not alert, you will keep on going back. Okay? There is one part which says Naya Pantha Ayanaya Vidyate and Vidyate Yanaya. So Naya Pantha Vidyate Yanaya. So if you don't, if you are not alert, you will switch one over the other and you will go on a totally wrong track. Same okay? in yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So what happens is that when you are chanting it slowly, then uh, sometimes you need to be far more alert uh, than otherwise and therefore it is more productive. Okay. Now, uh, as we have seen, the, uh, the uh, meditation is actually the best because we have seen how many different things are involved in meditation. One is just quietening down. Second is bringing the mind to the focus. Third thing is understanding the meaning of the mantra. And uh, so that means there are multifaceted faceted things which are happening in meditation. Therefore, meditation becomes a very important uh, means, which is better than the previous one. Now that, as I said, does not mean that you do only this and not the others. You can use it all because they all have their function. Okay? Whatever you can have a preference, there is nothing wrong. You may prefer to be in a quieter place than in the place where there is chanting or there are others who love Vedic chanting. So you can have preferences but if you have a notion that one is inherently superior than the other and other is something which is only for common man, this is not true. Because uh, many times, you know, even things like rituals which are very important um, uh, kind of uh, Vedic uh, forms uh, they are kind of disregarded by many and saying that, oh, these are just rituals, I am more evolved, you know. So you may want to do something else, there is nothing wrong, but that attitude that, okay, this is something which is lower is not correct, because each act of prayer is, as I had said earlier, is bringing to your mind your helplessness, which is a fact, the presence of law and doing something proactively about your helplessness in a constructive manner. Okay, So that means every form of prayer is very much valid, no matter what it is. Okay? Now, the next, um, the next uh, verse, which is 7th verse, it says, Ajyadharaya strosata samam sarala chintanam viralata param unbroken thinking like even the unbroken flow of ghee or the effortless flow of water is better than interrupted meditation. Okay? So generally our thinking is that I am in touch with Ishvara, the cause of the universe, only when I am sitting and I am doing some puja or I am sitting uh, in meditation. Okay? When I am doing other things, it seems as though I am not in touch with Ishvara. 
Okay. So here it's not that uninterrupted, uh, 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 so, uh, you know, relationship with Ishvara means you think that you always have to be in meditation. Okay. Or you have to prolong the time that you are doing your bhajans. This is not what it is. Okay. When you are acting and you are incorporating the law of dharma, you are bringing Ishvara in form of dharma in your understanding. So you are in touch with Ishwara. Okay? So it is not only at the time of prayers or at the time of puja or meditation that you are in touch with Ishwara when you are in midst of your activity, when you are an executive making a decision, when you are in your family talking to your children, talking to your wife, the attitudes that you have. How much are you incorporating the values of non-hurting, non-violence? How much are you showing the care? How, are, how much are you compassionate? How much you are able to check your tendency to be jealous, to be envious of others? Okay. All this is all dharma. The more you take into consideration all this while you are acting, you are in touch with Ishvara in form of Dharma. Okay? So that means non-interrupted does not mean longer hours of meditation. It means increasing the scope where you see the presence of Ishvara. Okay? Same thing we have seen already when the result comes. Life is nothing but in fact if you want to say what is success in life, three things if you can manage you have had basically a successful life. You have desires, then you act on those desires and you receive results based on those desires. Okay? Desire, unfortunately, people say, is something which is coming on your way of spiritual growth. It is not true. According to the vision of Vedas, Icha is a Shakti which is given to every individual. Even the word mumukshu means the desire to be free. Jignasa is desire to be, knowledge. desire for knowledge. Okay? So desire as such cannot be made into some kind of a black sheep that you have to avoid. Okay? Desiring is part of living. It is only your desire to make a contribution that you will do something. You can, your desire can take you, where Gandhiji's desire to give freedom to India, made him do what? Okay. So desire as such cannot be construed as something which is undesirable. Okay. It is all about managing our desires. Okay. So there is a, like we saw, that there is a line where our desires, sometimes we don't see the prudence of our desire. We don't assess whether our desires are, you know, um, proper or not in the first place. Okay. And secondly, means through which we accomplish those desires are sometimes not checked. Okay. That's when desires become a problem. Desires as such are not a problem. When I don't see the quality of my desire, my desire becomes to hurt, uh, you know, to see somebody down. Okay? That is unhealthy desire. Okay? How many times we can't, when somebody is saying that all the things that the person has accomplished, instead of being happy, what happens? You have to, some sense of envy inside. Okay? And that envy actually at times results in you're putting the person down. <coughs> oh yeah, this is all nothing. Okay. That quality is something that you have to check. What is making your attitudes like that? That you have to look into. Where is it coming from? Most of the time it comes from your own smallness. That you can't, if you're so small, you can't see somebody big. So that becomes a problem. Or as we have seen earlier, that if my desire for promotion is so much that at any cost I will get that, then that is a problem. So unchecked desires are something that need to be managed. 
but desire as such is a human privilege. Okay? So this is where when you understand Ishvara in form of Ichha Shakti, then you use this Shakti properly to accomplish things in life, there is Ishvara there. Okay? When you use your capacity to desire to know the knowledge, you are in touch with Ishvara. When you use your capacity to desire in order to grow as an individual, you are in touch with Ishvara. When you use your desire to make a contribution to the world, you are in touch with Ishvara. Okay? So it all depends upon how you manage your desires. Same thing with action. Action is something that how much are you able to use everything that we have seen in your actions. About Samanya Dharma, Swadharma, Loka Sangraha, how much are you taking into consideration? The more you take into consideration all these things, more you are in touch with Ishvara. It is not ethics only for ethics sake. Ishvara is manifestation of law of dharma. Ishvara is the intelligence which pervades everything and Ishvara is also the intelligence which makes us each form as it is. So to be in harmony with Ishvara is in every transaction that you do in your life, starting from desire, action and taking the results, then if you can bring in Ishvara in each of these three aspects, plus do prayers to take care of the helplessness or the unknown variables, then you are in touch with Ishwara when? Which part of your day? When? For any given part? At all. At all parts. Or in the whole waking. Your whole waking, you are in touch with Ishwara. This is what it says that this is better than just. During, during this time. Okay? That is something that has to be understood that, that the effortless flow is better than interrupted meditation. Veda Bhavana, the next verse, So Aham Itiyasau Bhavana Pida Pavani Mata. Now this comes to a very interesting point where it says, instead of meditating with an attitude of duality, I am different from the Lord, the non-dual vision, I am the Lord, is purifying. This is the view of the Shruti. Okay? So let us now understand the meaning of Ishwara as I had said, that the meditation involves seeing the meaning of the chant. What is the meaning of the chant? Ishai Namaha. What does it mean? That I salute to Ishwara. What is that Ishwara? In form of order. Okay. And not only in form of the order, but in the form of the whole manifest universe which includes all names and forms. Now, the question is, where am I in this whole equation? Now we have seen only about Ishwara's presence. Where you have to place your eye? You have to ask, where does my eye belong here? Generally, for all of us, where does the eye belong? In this body and mind. Okay. What we have seen so far, what is this body? Nothing but five elements, which are put together with amazing intelligence. <coughs> to do the function that it does. Okay? But these five elements, are they I? Is water I? No. Is the fire I? No. Space? No. Air? No. Prithvi? No. If five elements themselves are not I, this body, which is nothing but coming together of these five elements, which are intelligently put together, 
which is what we call the presence of Ishwara's order which puts it all together so that it can perform certain functions. Your eyes can see, your ears can hear, your nose can smell. There is a human range. Every human eye follows a certain range. But within that certain range, there are individual variations. For each of the capacity of each of the sense organs of the mind, of the organs of action. Each one of them is different, but at the same time, they all operate within a given range. Then animals, they have a different range altogether. So there is some intelligence involved, which is putting together five elements. There is no doubt about it. Okay. I have not come to put it all together to make this. It has come in this world. But if I need to ask this question, who am I, where do I place my I, I certainly cannot place it in the body because I know that this body is nothing but combination of five elements. If each of the five elements are not I, how can five elements come, coming together become I? Can it become I? Five non-I's coming together, can they become I? No. Okay. So that means that there is some error in how I understand who I am. Okay. Then the second level of association that we have is what we saw, mind. Okay. Mind as we saw earlier is what? Nothing but those five elements in their subtle form. Okay. Akasha, Vayu, Agni, Apaha, Prithvi. But in a subtle form. Intelligently put together so that they become brain neurons and they perform a given function. Okay. Now if again, whether these five elements are gross or they are subtle, the principle remains exactly the same. That if five elements are not I, a mind which is the product of five subtle elements coming together, does it become I or not? Is it I? No. All our life is taught thinking that I am as good as the body and the mind. I see clearly now that both this mind and the body are nothing but these five elements put together. They are not I. If that is the case, what exactly is the nature of I? What is I? Can I say that everything that I thought I was, I am not. So now I have to conclude that I don't exist. Can you say that? No. No. Why? Yes. You exist. How do you know that you exist? Have you used your eyes to see that you exist? Have you used your ears? No. How do you know that I am? How? The evolution. The kind no. of consciousness that I am aware of. Okay. So that means I exist is something that I am aware of without using my normal faculties. For everything else in this universe, I need to use, if I ask you, what is this object? You will have to use your eyes. If I put some music and I ask you, who is singing this song? You will have to use your ears. If I ask you about some equation of physics, you will have to not only use your eyes, but you will also have to use your inference capacity, which is you have to use your mind. For everything else in the universe, you need to use your senses along with your mind. I am is one reality which is known to you, okay? without using any of these faculties. So this is what the Shruti says, 
that I am is the only thing in this universe which is self-evident. Everything else is evident to me. My presence, I am, is self-evident. I am. You don't need to ask somebody. You don't need to infer anything. Now about this self-evident nature of I, which is this I, 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 you have many, many different conclusions. And all these different conclusions that you have are with reference to what? When you say I am fat, body. with reference to your body, when you say I am sad, my. Okay. When you say I'm jealous, okay. I'm blind. Okay. Senses. Okay. Every conclusion, examine each and every conclusion that you have about yourself. You will find that each one of it is either related to the body or mind. So that means you are making an error. You are taking I to be something that it is not. So what is that I then? I am which is self-evident. It is not that Shruti is telling you that you exist. You don't need Shruti. You don't need Upanishads and Gita to tell you I am. You need Upanishad and Gita to show you what your real nature is so that you get rid of your error which is giving you sense of limitation which doesn't exist in the first place. It's a notional limitation. Okay. So I am, when you begin to then say what I am, Shruti shows you that you don't need to search for I as an object. So it makes you see that you are that awareness or consciousness. Where do you find consciousness? When I use the word consciousness, everybody understands the meaning. Have you seen an object called consciousness? Have you ever seen something, an object? No. no. But you still know that there is consciousness. There is only one place that consciousness is available to you. That is in your buddhi, okay, as self-evident I. So what happens is there is this I, which is self-evident, consciousness, there is mind, which is nothing but different thoughts. So this consciousness gets mixed up with the thoughts and thinks that I am as good as the thoughts. When in reality, when the thought goes, we have seen, I am present. If I was as good as the thought, when the thought left, I should cease to exist. If I am silence, then, when the silence was taken over by thought, I should cease to exist. I am that consciousness which is free from any thought that happens in my mind. And I am also free from silence that I experience from time to time. So I am consciousness. This is my nature. Okay. And the whole world is, what is the whole world? We have seen the five elements coming together to create forms and the laws. Now this whole five elements and the laws, what we have seen? It is nothing but manifestation of one intelligence. We have seen Ishwara. So now I have to ask this question, what is the relationship between I consciousness 
and the world which I now understand to be Ishvara. Okay. Up to now, how I have been meditating? Me, the individual, subject to all the laws, that is what I am praying to, this is my meditation. Now, I have to re-examine this whole framework and I have to ask myself, hey, where, what is this I in this whole scheme of things? The I cannot be placed anymore in the body and mind. I can only be placed in consciousness and everything else, the whole world is nothing but what we saw, Ishvara. So what is my relationship with Ishvara now? Before I thought I was part of this vast scheme of things which is Ishvara. But if I am not this, then what is the relationship of consciousness with Ishvara? I have to ask this question. When I ask this question, I have to understand the nature of Ishvara a little bit better. Because now I have understood I am consciousness. Okay? Now I have to understand a little bit better what Ishvara is. When we say that I have understood, so the consciousness is separate and mind is separate. Okay, we will see the relationship. So okay, what is it? we will really see. The Who understands consciousness? Is it mind understands consciousness? We will see all that. Okay. We will see all this because it has to be. Just now, just try to see because I can't explain everything all at once, right? But here it says uh, the non-duality thinking uh, gives us a vision that I am the Lord. Yes, this is what I'm explaining you. I'm unfolding it to you now. Okay. Okay. But we have only can go step by step so that it becomes real. Otherwise it just remains a concept. Okay? So I'm taking you there. But we, you have to follow the line of thinking. Right? So I am God is, has to be understood for which you first have to see who I am. Because when you say I am God, there are two parts. It's like an equation. Okay. Equation means the two parts seem different, but they resolve in one. Okay. So for example, when I say two, 2 is equal to 2, is it an equation? No. Okay. But when I say 3 plus 2 is equal to 6 minus 1, it's an equation. Okay. In the equation, the two parts look very different. 3 is different from 6, plus is different from minus, 2 is different from 1. So there is all difference. But they both resolve in what? 5. That is the resolution point. So you have to inquire into each part. Here one side is I, the individual. The other side is Ishwara. You have to understand the true nature of I. You have to understand the true nature of Ishwara. And then there is a resolution point. Okay. So as long as you think that I am this individual, you can never be Ishwara. Because Ishwara is laws. Ishwara is the entire universe, all the bodies, all the mind. You are not that. So you first have to understand who is this I. You are first working on one part of the equation. In order to come to this point of resolution, you have to look at each one and find the common point of resolution. So first you have to negate what you are not. Because if you don't negate, you will continue to keep your eye in this and you will imagine yourself to be Ishvara and you will be taken for a perpetual ride. Because that's not what Shruti is saying. You are very limited. Your body is very limited. If your eye is kept in the body and you start imagining that you are Ishvara, you, you are on some trip. So therefore, you have to first understand when Shruti says, I am Ishvara, what is meant by that I? Not your notion of what I is. Okay? It is talking about consciousness. Because the body is nothing but five elements, that's not I. The mind is nothing but five elements working together, that's not I. 
So when you have inquired into this side of the equation about I, the true nature of I comes to consciousness. Okay. Now we are looking into the other side of the equation, Ishvara. So what is Ishvara? Up to now, we have seen that Ishvara is in form of all the orders, physical, biological, epistemological, psychological, law of dharma, law of karma, all these various laws that exist right now, here, here, not some person out there. Law of forces. Law of forces. And Ishvara also includes all these five elements, the sun, the moon, and all these individuals that, you know, that exist, you know, individuality that exists in the universe. Okay? So that means Ishvara is, what is Ishvara is the intelligence which makes everything what it is. Okay? Ishvara, we have to understand, in order to understand the loss, okay, now let's examine a little bit more about what Ishvara is. When I say Ishvara is the loss, what exactly is meant? We saw that when we talk about laws of physics, it's nothing but intelligence looked at it from the standpoint of how the physical universe works. When you look at the laws of psychology, it is the intelligence, the way it kind of configures your mind in a way that what experiences that you have in your childhood or throughout your life is going to give you a certain framework with which you are going to transact in the world. Okay? So there is this intelligence. It is all nothing but intelligence. When you look at the laws, when what we call laws, it is insight into the intelligence from a given standpoint. Okay. When you look at the five elements, how they are put together, when these five elements of, you know, it's not just some water is randomly here, some vayu is already, you know, air is here, it's not all just some randomly put together. The intelligence that is required to make these five elements to make it into body, each organ, your kidney, your lungs, your liver, your intestines, it's, it's not an ordinary job at all. So that means that there is intelligence at work here also. Making all the cells, there are I don't know how many millions of cells in the body, how many millions of cells of... Uh, billions, uh, billions. billions of billions. Millions of billions of cells in the body and some of them are constantly changing. Okay. They are all put in harmony to perform all these different functions that is required for your body to continue and to transact in the world. That intelligence is at work here, here and now, here, here, everywhere. Okay. So that means Ishvara, when we understand, we have to understand that it is nothing but one vast intelligence. Okay. So, the, this side of equation, I, consciousness, Ishvara, this vast intelligence. Okay. Now, so I individual seems to me like this little individual. Ishvara seems to me like this vast intelligence. What is the resolution point? One minute. Okay. This all intelligence which pervades in the whole universe. Okay, What is its relationship with consciousness? You have to ask. Because here I is consciousness. Here you what we found? All intelligence. Now you have to find the relationship between intelligence and consciousness. What is the relationship? In order to understand this relationship, you have to understand one thing. Very, very important thing which is bread and butter of Vedanta. Okay. If I ask you, 
what is this? What is this? A desk. A desk. Okay. Now you say it is a desk and if I say that it is wood, who is right? Both are right. Both are right but wood and desk are not synonyms. Okay? Because they are not synonyms, one of us has to be more right than the other. Who is more right? Without the wood, there is nothing. Exactly. Without the wood, there is no desk. Okay? So that means that if, if you say it is desk, I said, okay, I am taking away the wood. Because I say it is wood, I take away the wood. Will there be any object called desk remaining? No. No. So that means that it's very interesting. Both are not totally wrong. It's not that you are wrong when you are saying it is desk. But I am more right. Because what is the relationship? The wood is existing independently of being the desk. But the desk entirely depends upon wood for its existence. If you take out the wood, there is no desk. Okay? So that which has independent existence in Sanskrit, it is called Satya. Okay? And that which has a dependent reality, which has a dependent existence, is what we call Mithya. Because it, it, you can't call it mithya, people generally think is illusion, unreal. We are not talking about unreal here. We are not talking about something here. This is not an illusion. It is there, therefore I am able to put the paper here. I am able to, you know, uh, put my glasses here. And its dimension will decide how many things I can put. We are not talking about delusion. We are talking about the order of reality that this given object enjoys. Neither you can say that it is non-existent, nor you can say that it is totally independently existence. It has this in-between existence, which is what we call a provisional existence, which is name, it has a name, it has a form, and it has a function. Okay? So this is what we say, the dependent reality or a mithya. The satyam is wood. Okay? Now, wherever there is desk, wherever there is mithya, there is satyam as its very basis. You don't look for satyam somewhere else. Wherever there is mithya, the very adhishthana is where satyam is. Okay? If you understand that, now let us go back and look at the relationship between intelligence and consciousness. Can any intelligence exist without the presence of consciousness? No. Whether it is my little intelligence or it is all intelligence. Okay? The basic relationship between intelligence and consciousness is that intelligence cannot exist without consciousness, but consciousness is inherently free from intelligence. Okay? In order to understand this relationship, let us go to my own intelligence, my little intelligence within this vast intelligence. What is, what is human intelligence? When we say human, somebody is intelligent, what does it mean? That the mind is able to capture certain information as it is. So when I show you, you know, yeah, that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, and you are able to understand it as it is, then, you know, without projecting, without being confused, I mean 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 is something which starts in first standard but it can get very complex in terms of all the engineering equations that you all learn. So your capacity to capture all these equations correctly is what makes you intelligent. Okay? 
So that means human intelligence is in terms of, let's say, your capacity in terms of when some information is giving, given to you externally, you convert it into your thoughts and then you recognize those thoughts. Okay? So that means what is the content of the thought which has understood that equation correctly? There is one thought which I have which is not capturing this reality correctly. So I am considered to be dumb. Because the teacher is teaching, you are absorbing information, I am absorbing information. We are all creating thoughts, trying to make sense of what the teacher is saying. If your thoughts are capturing what the teacher's intention is correctly, then you are considered intelligent. If my thoughts are not in line with what the teacher is explaining, I am considered unintelligent. Okay? But whether it is so-called unintelligent thought or an intelligent thought which is able to capture information accurately, what is the content of the thought? Can you conceive a thought without presence of awareness or consciousness? No. Okay. But consciousness can be independent of thought. That's why when the thought goes, consciousness is. But the thought is consciousness with a given form. Human form, which makes a particular thought. Then that thought goes, another thought comes. Consciousness in that given form. Okay? So the thought is mithya. Consciousness is satya. Like in this case, wood is satya. Table is mithya. Forms are mithya. The content is satya. So with reference to human intelligence, the relationship is that thoughts which make you intelligent are mithya and consciousness is satya. Now all intelligence does not require a mind. It is because of which every mind is what it is. It is the intelligence which gives parameters to human brain. It gives parameters to animal brain. It gives parameters to how the universe is going to operate. It is not one given individual mind. Okay? But the basic relationship is any intelligence cannot exist without consciousness. But consciousness is independent of intelligence. Okay? So, in the equation, I and that, if you don't inquire, it seems as though I am this little individual who is subject to laws of Ishwara. And you continue to pray in meditation as me, the individual who is praying to Ishwara. But what Ramana is saying is, if the meditation is done with the awareness that I am essentially this identical, there is an identity between me and Ishwara, then that is the most significant or the most important meditation because it is in keeping with reality. Okay. Where I am not continuing this false notion about who I am and I am not continuing with no understanding or partial understanding of Ishvara. It is seeing both sides of the equation clearly and understanding that there is a point of resolution here. Okay. So what seems to be two very very different paths, me the individual who is limited who has many, you know, is limited in terms of my knowledge, limited uh, in terms of my capacity to maneuver things, limited in terms of my uh, 
capacity to desire, capacity to do, capacity to know, in every way unlimited. Ishvara is this intelligence which pervades the whole universe, making it everything what it is. But when you look at the truth of that intelligence, what is the truth is consciousness or awareness, because the relationship is that of Satyam and Mithya. No intelligence can exist without consciousness. Okay? And when I look at the true nature of myself, when I say I am limited in terms of knowledge, what am I referring to? I am referring to the capacity of my mind. But the mind is already understood as nothing but five elements coming together and performing some functions. So if I place my eye correctly, I come to consciousness. If I understand Ishwara correctly all the way, where do I come to? Consciousness. Okay. At this point, there is a complete resolution. It is made and apparent differences remain. It's not you are trying to experientially trying to resolve this universe or anything. I will just end by one example which is a very important example that Vedantins use. Okay? So you, it is that of wave. Okay? So every wave is like an individual. Then you have the ocean which, from which every wave arises unto which every wave resolves which is the governing principle within which not only the waves but everything else exists in the ocean. When any given wave inquires into the truth of that little wave, what it will find? What is the truth? Wave is a form. What is the content of wave? Water. 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 Now, ocean is a much bigger form. What is the content of ocean? Water. Water. Okay. Where is the point of resolution? Water. Is water ever limited by being wave or being the ocean? It is always free. Water is H2O. It is always free from being the wave and being the ocean. It already what we call transcends. Transcends in the sense that there is no effort. It already is a fact. It is already free from attributes of wave, which represents smallness, and ocean, which represents all encompassing form, where all the forms are included. Okay. The consciousness is exactly the same. Consciousness is the truth of individual and consciousness, individual form, which is you, and consciousness is also the truth of the total, Ishwara. Consciousness is always free from being both. This is the teaching and this is where Damana Maharshi says, if you see it as non-dual, essentially you are Ishvana, then that is the highest because it's, it is in keeping with what is. This is the reality. That means you are living in the world, being alive to what is, rather than from your own notion of what is. Okay. We will see this more later. See, we have to see through the mind actually, right? Yeah, so, yeah. When the term uh, I understand that mm -hmm. consciousness exists everywhere and intelligence and consciousness mm -hmm. exist together actually. So it has to be made understood to the mind, right? Absolutely. You need mind to understand this reality. Okay. See the absolutely we will see all this is coming very much in detail. How you understand this reality, what is the process, everything will come. Okay. Yeah. But you are absolutely right that without mind, you cannot understand. So you need mind. Consciousness is independently existing inside. 
Exactly. Consciousness is all pervasive. All pervasive. Yes. And it is also here. Exactly. Yes. So it has to be made understood to the mind, right? Absolutely. That means that the mind understands its own truth through this inquiry. Generally, you think that I am as good as the mind. Now you use the mind to understand its own relativity and the truth of that mind. Okay. That is how the whole process is. So Satyam and Mithya are mixed together. As I said, yes, yes. Satyam is never away from Mithya. There are no two separate things here. Okay? Wherever there is a thought, there is consciousness. But consciousness is always free from being a thought. So you, don't, don't, have you don't try to physically separate the two. Hmm. So a wave need not give up its form. By being a wave, it can understand that I am water. water always free from being the way or any dimensions that the way has. Same thing. You use your mind. This is why human birth is considered to be very important because human birth is the place, is the mind which is developed enough to undertake this inquiry. Okay? So you use your mind to look at the nature of reality and you use the thoughts to understand the relativity of the thoughts itself and see the content which is always free. This is the whole process through inquiry. The Shastra basically is the reality. The animals do have mind but it is not developed enough to undertake this inquiry. That's why they don't do PhDs and they don't do, so, you know, they don't have complexes and they don't have sense of, uh, you know, uh, that I'm no good. It's like uh, Swamiji was saying, a cow, the black cow, doesn't have any complex, right, in <laughs> India. But in South Indians, everybody has, you know, somebody was saying that the cream that sells the most is fair and lovely. Okay. So cow doesn't have a complex, it doesn't run to some beauty parlor to say that, oh my god, you know, I want a facial because I want to look better. Okay? But you do because you want to look younger, you want to take out your wrinkles and this is what we say, that, that mind is the greatest blessing because it can understand this truth, but that mind is also something which will make you confused much more than if you are not, you know, uh, careful, I mean, it can give you complexes. So it really depends upon what you do with this amazing instrument that is Intelligence given. is there in the animals also. There, it's there, but it is Literally limited. Can see, Absolutely. So it can see it is limited. And we are saying it's a highly... The, yeah, complicated they have, intelligence. We even, see. even inference is there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just, I will stop now because we all have to go for lunch, mm -hmm. otherwise you will move on. But one thing that it's true that uh, uh, animals have intelligence in uh, Taitiriya Bhashyam. Adi Shankaracharya says there is a cow, right? And you go with a stick. What will it do? Run away. What is it using? Inference. Okay? Stick means that there is a possibility of my being hurt and it will run. Okay? And then if uh, you go with a nice grass, what will it come? What will it do? Come, come. So they have, they have intelligence and they have, they not only have perception but they also have inference to a certain degree but it is not they don't go to classes they don't come for moksha they don't come searching for moksha they don't say oh i so that doesn't happen that's all that doesn't mean that they are not intelligent Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamiva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Om Shri Guru Purnamaha Hari Om